Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. They did. They absolutely got it right. And this is Tom Novolis, your host, and I am so delighted that you're back with me again this week. We have a lot to cover, as always. And it's been a very interesting week, especially for those who say they believe in the Constitution. Um, hopefully, more and more people are reading the Constitution. But in fact, the, just because you read the Constitution, it, it, not many understand it. And they say a lot of different reasons. I mean, at a recent conference that I was at, I had a person come up and said, Geez, do you think you can modernize the language in the Constitution so we could understand it? And I'm looking at him and going, well... It's not hard to understand. What you have to do is learn how to read and understand English, American English. And what is it that our founders wanted to say? But as an adult, this guy probably was like almost 50 years old, maybe a little older. So that takes you way back. And not having an understanding of common language, which the Constitution was written for the common man and woman to understand. Hmm. So here we have it. In now, 2019, that we even have less people that understand it. And it's proven every day of the week when you look at not only in the national execution, and I do mean execution of the Constitution, but all the way down into the states. So as I've been speaking about for the last several years is why I compiled what I did with the book sitting here on my bookshelf, and it should be on your bookshelf, is Covenant from Covenant to the Present Constitution. This is what we have no clue of in America anymore, is what is it? It's not just reading the Constitution. It's understanding how it should be implemented and what has taken it to the point of being the confusing insanities that are happening every day of the week, some of which we're going to talk about today. I have some news articles that make it very, very re relevant uh, and something that I want to take you back to in this first segment is just the preamble. We went to a event about the Constitution this past week, and Mr. Adams had a chance to appear and, and actually had a, a few moments to speak as well. But it was really interesting is that a young person was asked to get up and read the preamble. Now, the preamble in itself, and we talk about it in the book and in the seminars, and Dr. Kimber talks about it, is that it is the glossy form of what was intended. Okay, When, when the Constitution went to the Committee on Style, instead of taking and putting all of the content there, it instead was rendered down into the present preamble, which has allowed a number of different things to occur. And one of the people that commented uh, about the preamble is none other than our good friend out of New York uh, by the name, or I should say by the pseudonym, uh, of Brutus. And he wrote in Brutus number 12, and this was February 7th of 1788. Now, you see the volumes are changing. So once again, I'm holding up the Founders Constitution. And this is volume two that begins with the preamble and goes up through, I think it is, let's see here, Article 1, Section 8, Clause. Well, it finishes off. With that, it finishes off with uh, Section uh, 8, Clause 4. And that is within, let's see, 642 pages. 
So if we have 642 pages of foundational explanation just on the preamble all the way through, you know, here it is, Article 1, Section 8, that's a lot to understand and comprehend and to get original intent and that understanding of the original intent. It's clear. It's here. But instead, we have the likes of a, a subcommittee that I watched where Jerry Nadler, the communist, was taking and just making a mockery of everything that that committee should hold to. But as I said, and I've talked about many times, the Kozak plan is to have these elected people who are the socialists, who are the communists. And, oh, by the way, go look. And I did a whole program several months ago on the uh, the Congressional Progressive Committees. I mean, uh, caucus, Congressional Progressive Caucus. If you haven't taken and looked at that, uh, the link is in the promo and I'll make sure that with the video that the link is there on uh, the archive as well, because go look at the names of all the people on that committee that Jerry Nadler, the socialist, progressive, almost card-carrying communist, is a part of, and go check all those other members. I pretty much can guarantee you that just about, I would say, 90 plus percent of those members are part of that Congressional Progressive Caucus. We have the destruction that Brutus talks about and others talk about as anti-federalist because the communists have been elected into office and you have a thin line, ladies and gentlemen, that are preventing them from totally destroying constitutionalism, which they are doing. And so here's what Brutus had to say about that in that 7 February, 1788. To discover the spirit of the Constitution, it is of the first importance to attend to the principal ends and designs it has in view. These are expressed in the preamble in the following words, quote, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. End quote. If the end of the government is to be Learn from these words, which are, yeah, flip the page, they're big pages, clearly designed to declare it. It is obvious it has in view every object which is embraced by any government. The preservation of internal peace, the due administration of justice, and to provide for the defense of the community. Seems to include all the objects of government. But if they do not, they are certainly comprehended in the words. That's important. Comprehended in the words. Quote, to provide for the general welfare. End quote. Comprehended in those particular words. If it be further considered that this Constitution, if it is ratified, will not be a compact entered into by states in their corporate capacities, but an agreement of the people of the United States as one great body politic, no doubt can remain, but that the great end of the Constitution, if it is to be collected from the preamble in which its end is declared, 
is to constitute a government which is to extend to every case for which any government is instituted, whether external or internal. The courts, therefore, will establish this as a principle in the expounding the Constitution and will give every part of it such an explanation as will give latitude to every department under it to take cognizance of every matter, not only for that affects the general and national concerns of the Union, but also of such as relate to the administration of private justice and to regulating the internal and local affairs of the different parts. Such a rule of exposition is only consistent with the general spirit of the preamble, but it will stand confirmed by considering more minutely the different clauses of it. So just in taking a look at the preamble, and when I do the seminar, I, I have a little fun with the preamble and actually take in, on the slide presentation, switch up some pieces in there. And maybe you can guess what they are, but if not, you're going to have to attend the seminar on the book. But several important parts here that have now led us to the point of where we are in the nation today. The first point is that if the Constitution was a compact between the states within their corporate essence, within their legal bounds as independent republics, that was one thing. That would be one way for how the Constitution would be implemented and exercised and properly executed. But if by virtue that the preamble is stating that we the people are now the whole body that it leads to and can by virtue of what this interpretation is by Brutus is that it becomes that which we hear, even with the Reputicans, a democracy, a constitutional democracy. No, we're not that. We're a constitutional republic. But then what I think is extremely insightful, and as I say about the Anti-Federalists, is predictive. None other than Brutus said the courts would decide. They would decide how this is implemented at not only every department that would be executing and exercising the way that the government should be carried out. No. They said that the courts, and what he says here, and he talks about it differently in some of his other uh, writings, especially about the court, is that the court will get into everything and impose federal, statutory, and judicial implementation of everything right down into, yes, as he says in another, your boudoir ladies and men into your wine cellars. And that's what we have. We have this, as we're going to talk about in the next couple segments, some of the interesting aspects of now the boom, execution of the Constitution and how it is being destroyed by the enemies within. Those like Nadler with his glasses sitting up there and chewing on bar. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we are really in a hurt bump. And a lot of it is, is because our educational system and the churches have allowed it to happen. And that's one article that I'm going to cover uh, in the second segment. So those of you uh, who are at Soaring Eagle Radio, you're going to have to come back or go to the archives and see what's happening on YouTube to get what I'm going to be talking about in, relative to Christianity and uh, what that means within the execution of our governance, starting with self-governance. So it's really going to be a lot of fun. So we have a lot more to cover in the next two segments here. It's Samuel Adams Returns, and yes, just starting with Brutus, right here at the preamble, those anti-federalists, they did. They absolutely got it right, 
And I look forward to you coming back in second and third segment to continue the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They absolutely got it right. And this is Tom Neville is your host and delighted that you're here again. A couple different things that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, first off is that I'd like you to go check out something that we have going on. The store isn't open yet. But uh, for all of you out there that are, are in Ohio and listening at Soaring Eagle Radio in Lima, Ohio in particular, and some of you had the opportunity to meet Sam Adams, uh, I would like you to go to pepper-licious.com and take a look at what we have going on there with some really interesting specialty hot peppers, but more so what's there on really specialty jams that are jamming. I mean, they are jamming. So uh, go take a look at pepper-licious, pepperlicious.com. And uh, hopefully within the next week or so, we'll have the store up and you can uh, buy those online. But if you would like to, we can take and... Uh, work with you on something if you have any interest in either the peppers or in the jam. So contact us there. Also, I mentioned and was talking about in the first segment, the book's available at Amazon. The link is there in the uh, site, and that is for From Covenant to the Present Constitution. Within that, you're going to get some insights that you won't get anywhere else as to what is happening with the Constitution, the implementation of it, and as I said in the first segment, the execution of it. So uh, get the book. Get the book, and I think you'll find it very, very interesting. There's a lot in there, a lot of references, and it's a, it's a textbook, really, is what it is. I do want to mention and thank my good friends at Liberty Works Radio Network for, again, having this program available. Folks, go check out all the programming there at Liberty Works Radio Network and push that donate button. This is yours. This is your network. There's all sorts of stuff out there where you can get your information, but this is a place that is unique in what you're going to hear and receive. I, it's Look, I'll just be honest with you. It has to be unique. If I'm on this programming, good gravy. It's like, okay, let's have some fun with that. And I do want to thank uh, my good friend, Dr. Spaulding, with Soaring Eagle Radio there in Lima, Ohio. So you can go to SoaringEagleRadio.com. And uh, it is WTTP 101.1 FM. And if you're listening to me at 7 p.m. on Saturdays in either network, or actually at Soaring Eagle, it's 8 p.m. in the evening, then uh, thank you for uh, being there. And those at Soaring Eagle, the only way you're hearing that plug is if you're taking and watching the archives at Yes. What is it? Let me hear it. I know you know it. SamuelAdamsReturns.net. Well, with all of that promo stuff, let's get to some meat. Let's get to some meat. That meat definitely being something that I continuously talk about, continuously learn about, continuously uh, am trying to Put the pieces together within this whole, uh, I guess, the, the, this whole mess on the execution of the Constitution in an appropriate manner in our day and age. It was interesting that those other characters that were at the event for Constitution Day were people that were one one fellow was there who was portraying George Washington, and he does a really bang up job. He's he's done it in a number of places, and I think he's actually gone down to uh, Williamsburg to participate in that at one time. 
he brought out very clearly what both Madison and John Adams said about the Constitution. And that statement, you know very clearly, is that it is only, let me make that emphasis, and I know all of you who are listening here on this network and are watching the archive at SamuelAdamsReturns.net know that it was those key words that Madison and John Adams said regarding the implementation and execution of Constitution. It is what? It is only for a moral and religious per people, one said. The other said, it is only for a moral and virtuous people. The interesting thing about that is that in both regards, they established morality as that very first footprint. And you cannot have true morality without having some presence of mind and heart in relationship to God and God's word and what is right and wrong and the basic fundamentals of the Ten Commandments. Now, one used the term religious people and the other virtuous people. And to have true virtue, you need again to have that true sense. And when they talked about religion, they were talking about Christianity. That's what they viewed. That was what was ubiquitous throughout the colonies, whether some practiced or not. They understood, the founders understood that morality, virtue, and religion were tied together. No other way could this Constitution function. It's obvious when you watch a lot of these different hearings, especially with those that are <clears throat> so-called on the left, or in my case, I call them democrats. And with the democrats in particular, it's obvious they have no virtue out the door. They obviously and declare openly, unless it's a false religion, they have no religion out the door. And where is their morality? What does that mean? Their morality is a morality that they create in their own minds. They create it in their own determination. And that leads me to uh, some interesting articles that I saw, and I, I am going to bring them to your attention because I've seen them replicated, and I want to go to a, a single source instead of jumping around to multiple sources. But here's something that came out this afternoon. <clears throat> I mean, not this afternoon. It came out the other day. I'm sorry. I'd look at and boom, there's a timestamp. Anyway, it came out the other day in the afternoon. Here's the headlines. Are you ready? NBC prompts Americans to confess climate sins. Eating steak, using Q-tips. Hey, you know what? Use the end of your uh, 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 right there on your glasses, your reading glasses. You know, fit there. You know, maybe if you're right, it'll go right through. Too much toilet paper. Now they want you to be like the jihadis. Hey. Which hand do you eat with? Which hand do you wipe with? Anybody that's been in the sandbox, spent time in the Middle East, you have a clear understanding of uh, which hand is up. Interesting. Too much toilet paper. Wow. Get used to it. Make sure you can wash your hands. Oh, then you're using too much water. Thrashing metal straws. No heart for fake meat. You got to cut back on eating that meat. You have to confess your climate sins. Religion? Morality? Mm, no virtue. Religion? The religion of Gaia. Oh my. You're earth worshipers. To confess your sin, you have to 
have an understanding that something has to be the God. You know, in the Old Testament, that's what the God of heaven, the God of creation, the God of all things slammed on Israel and every other people for, judge them severely because they set up idolatry. If you're going to take and worship and oh, talk about your confessed climate sins. So with that, you know, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this one. With that, here's a headline also. Union Theological Seminary holds confession to plants in a chapel ceremony. If you haven't seen that one, go look at the link in the archives, because here they set up this, I guess it would be a nice garden in your house if you wanted it like that, but look at the pictures. And... Uh, Here's these people around the garden, sitting cross-legged, sitting, however, and confessing to the plants. Because as they say, and this is a seminary, okay, a seminary, which are cemeteries, and we know this one's whacked out, okay, but that is not just there. Let's talk about a lot of different Christian colleges, Catholics, colleges and cemeteries. Look at this. I mean, on the Catholic side, they even have the Pope who's going along with all this insanity. So wait a minute. How can you worship the God of the Bible and call climate change? Oh no, it's an idol. Setting up these idols. When you have all of these other denominations, especially these leftist ones that come from this Union Theological Cemetery and other denominational cemeteries worshiping and saying that we should confess our sins to the plants, confess our sins about climate change, to whom, to what? Oh my goodness. Why do we have the problems we have? What judgment are we under? What is it about properly implementing the Constitution? What did Brutus say that the courts would do? What do we look at in our personal lives when it comes to that which is what? Virtue? Oh, let's start it out right. Morality. Where is your source of moral determination? How do you know something is morally correct? I want to talk about it in the next segment a little bit more about the mental health board that I'm on and what I'm seeing in the state of Ohio, which is happening across all the United States, in particular to students. But it's for the children. But when we look at this and we look and study the Old Testament and even the things that Jesus said about idolatry, when we look at the Old Testament in particular, that's what it was. It was the political leaders. It was the pastoral leaders, the Sanhedrin. It was all of those religious leaders, the Sanhedrin again, that were leading the people astray. No different than today. So when I look at the pulpits and I look at a number of these different modern Calvinism 2.0 and some of these other theological perspectives, and then I start going back and looking at what the reformers were talking about when I was looking at what does it mean from that solid reading of biblical truth and what we're supposed to be doing and acknowledging the creator of the whole universe and the salvation that he alone can provide, that we're in deep trouble. And it's not just because of these people's ideologies. We're in deep trouble yeah, because of them, and that God historically judges not just individuals, but he judges nations. He judges whole people kinds. You know, Sam Adams gave us warnings about that as well. 
he did, the Anti-Federalists did, they absolutely got it right. And we're going to continue on some of this and a little bit more about Sam Adams in the next segment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this third segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did, they absolutely got it right. And I keep proving that segment after segment after segment after segment, either from this whole series of books right here that are the Founders Constitution, where it takes and it gives the perspective and not only just the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers, but what it does is it goes through all of the other people that had input into the Constitution, into the various arguments, and puts it all together. And then, once again, in what I'm talking about out of from covenant to the present Constitution, without belaboring that. And we were talking about in the last segment, which those who are joining us now from Soaring Eagle Radio, is the idolatry that is there, and what we're seeing in articles, not only from one of the major so-called news media, but also what's going on in the cemeteries. I mean, seminaries. Yeah, they're cemeteries. They really are. Majority of them are. Anyway, so just for a quick refresher, uh, go into the archives or go to samueladamsreturns.net uh, to those archives so that you can see in there the links to the article regarding the Union Theological Seminary holds confession to plants in the chapel ceremony. You got to do that. You got to go confess to the plants about your sins on climate change. And then NBC prompts Americans to confess climate sins. I guess they want you to go to the UTS campus so you can go in their chapel and confess your sins at that holy ground. Or there's a lot of the, um, a lot of ma even major denominations where the pastors are jumping on this climate change bandwagon. Now that becomes the God. Wow. So remember, you can't eat steaks. You can't use Q-tips. Keep your ears all waxed up. Because then you don't, you have an excuse for not hearing truth when your ears are all waxed up. Can't use that toilet paper. Remember, which hand? Okay, those in a sandbox who went to the sandbox, those who spent time in the Middle East, which hand do you use? Trashing metal straws. And forsake meat. Forsake meat. I don't know what you're going to eat. Anyway, all of that to say that, um, yeah. We got some deep issues, and they all start and go to, as I said in the last segment, what's happening with the pulpits. And in SamuelAdamsReturns.net, there is about what I say all the time. Go in there, click on that, chaplains and clergy, and you'll find out what was being taught at the pulpits, in the pulpits, during the foundation of America. All right, let's get over here to Sam Adams for a minute because here's something that ties together. Sam was taking and writing this letter, and, and what I was looking at was on economy. I was looking at how this all fit together, and I'm going to jump into a couple things here because it goes back to the first segment and ties into that virtue, that morality, religion, uh, whole concept of what does it mean, first off, to be a manly man, and second off, what does it mean to be able to govern correctly, especially in the proper implementation, the proper using the word execution, not from the demon crap way of using execution to destroy the Constitution, but to execute it in a way that was intended according to our founders' principles and purposes. So anyway, Sam was taken and writing to his, I think it was his son-in-law, is uh, Thomas Wells. Let me see. Thomas Wells, Thomas Wells, a younger brother of Elizabeth Wells. He married the daughter of Adams. So in effect, Thomas Wells is Sam Adams' son-in-law. In here, he's talking about the letter that he was writing, and he had some uh, 
uh, entertaining some doubt, uh, and and then he was going through some things on respect and the confidence that he places uh, in his son-in-law. I think I gave you the strongest proof of this when I was last in Boston. Uh, from the moment I have considered myself partially interested in your welfare. I cannot indeed be otherwise, since I then consented that you should form the most intimate connection with the dear girl whom I pride myself in calling my daughter. I did this with caution and deliberation. Okay, dads, if you have the opportunity to uh, inquire and to study the person that would be your son-in-law, here's the thing here, is that Sam Adams did this with Thomas Wells with caution and deliberation. And having done it, I am now led to contemplate the relation in which I am myself to stand with you. What's he going to do with his son-in-law? And I can hardly forbear the same style in this letter, which I should take the liberty to use if I was writing to her. Everyone listen. The marriage state was designed to complete the sum of human happiness in this life. Isn't that profound? Why are we taking and going through all of these insanities? Oh, Tom, it is. It's the evil. There is real evil. It's the morality. The morality to be able to execute good governance has to start at home, and it has to be this simple fact. What was marriage? Man and woman marriage. Marriage in itself is a state that was designed to complete the sum of human happiness in this life. It sometimes proves otherwise, but this is owing to the parties themselves who either rush into it without due consideration or fail in point of discretion in their conduct towards each other afterwards. It requires judgment on both sides to conduct with extra propriety, for though it is acknowledged that the superiority is and ought to be in the man, yet as the management of a family in many instances necessarily devolves on the woman. It is difficult always to determine the line between the authority of the one and the subordination of the other. Perhaps the advice of the good bishop of St. Asaph on another occasion, might be adopted on this, and that is not to govern too much. When the married couple strictly observes the great rules of honor and justice towards each other, differences, if any happen, between them must proceed from small and trifling circumstances. Of what consequence is it whether a turkey is brought on the table, boiled or roasted. And yet, how often are the passions suffered to interfere in such a mighty disputes till the tempers of both become so soured that they can scarcely look upon each other with any tolerable degree of good humor. I am not led to this particular mode of treating the subject from an apprehension of more than common danger. That such kind of fricas will frequently take place in the connection upon which much of my future comfort in life will depend. And when he's talking about his future life, he's talking about eternal life. I am too well acquainted with the liberty of your way of thinking to harbor such a jealousy, and I think I can trust to my daughter's discretion if she will only promise to exercise it. I feel myself at this moment so domestically disposed that I could say a thousand things to you if I had leisure. I could dwell on the importance, importance of piety and religion, religion and piety and virtue, morality, religion, piety, virtue, or industry and frugality of 
prudence. An economy, regulatory, and an even government, all of which are essential to the well-being of the family. Do you hear that? So he establishes all these things. Then he goes in here. And even government, all are essential to the well-being of a family. But I have not time. I cannot, however, help repeating piety because I think it indispensable. Religion in a family is at once its brightest ornament and its best security. The first point of justice, says a writer I have met with, consists of piety. Nothing certainly being so great a debt upon us as to render to the creator and preserver those acknowledgments which are due him for our being and the hourly protection he affords us. Just got the four minute button from Kath here, and I just wanted to take and say that this is a profound letter. It wasn't just taking and writing to his son in law and expressing these points from points of theory. No, these were points and real life positions for Sam Adams. He was a pious person. He was a flamethrower as well, but he did it appropriately under the instances of piety for justice, because that's what he said. If you're going to take and you're going to take and have that first point of justice, it consists in piety. And then there's nothing that brings any certainty to anything except rendering the creator, the preserver, the acknowledgments which are due him. So that means the essence of religion, and it has to be within the context of the family. So that brings into everything that the ideas that Madison was talking about and what John Adams was inferring to as well, when you look at this constitution that we took and observed a remembrance of this past week, it is only for a moral and virtuous slash religious people. That goes all the way back here to family and understanding. What are those truths? What does that mean? And I can't really, I don't have the time to comment about um, what happened or what's happening you know, from the county board that I'm on. But let's put it this way. Let's sum it like this. None of this is in the schools. The majority of this is not in the churches and heard from the pulpits. So therefore... We have the Jerry Nadlers and everyone else, all the other demons that were sitting to his right in all these committee meetings that are progressives, which are socialist slash communist, and even jihadist now, their morality has no alignment with foundational piety, religion, morality, and virtue. Therefore, there's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do to make those changes at the national government level, let alone where you really need to be focusing is at the local government level, because maybe you can have some influence in the pulpits that you attend and participate in. You see, that's the crux of it. That is the root of it. That's the root of what Sam Adams was even saying to his son-in-law in relationship to his wife. How he's going to even treat his wife over a turkey dinner. How is he going to take and interact on all those little piddly things that crop up? How do you handle that which is in your home before you can even handle that which is in your job. This is the extensibility of gospel, as I always talk about. Remember this. Home, yourself first. Your home, then what goes into your job, and what goes into your community around you. How are those governing in the boards as unelected people or those that you elect? The ideas of the federal government transcends all the way through every aspect of government and into the townships, 
into the counties, into the cities, into everything. And this is what Sam Adams talked about. And this is what the Anti-Federalists knew. So go to SamuelAdamsReturns.net and look for the archives. Look for this letter. I'm putting that up there. Come on back next week.